thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, let me just give you the format of the show. Since Sharon, you haven't uh, been here before, but I'm delighted that you're here with us. Um, you know, best places to lead. The whole goal is how do we help leaders lead our people better and set them up for success? Because the goal is to create compelling companies that outperform and still make it home for dinner. That's uh, really what we're thinking about. And so today we have an amazing guest, Eric Cabral, who uh, spent 20 years in corporate America before deciding to break out and become a serial entrepreneur, which I wanna hear a little bit about that, Eric, when we get there. But I, I just love that one of the things that we're so aligned on is this thing right here, right? Because you talk about this, how are we going to make the world a better place? And I am on that same mission with you, which is, hey, I think I'm only going to live once. And so why not just have this opportunity to be yourself, be authentic, make the impact with intention. And that's why we have you here today, because we have so many common friends who kept on saying, you have to meet Eric Cabral. You have to meet Eric Cabral. And, uh, and then I finally met you. And I was like, this is one of the smartest, nicest guys I have ever met. So thanks for being here with us. Thank you so much, Jerry, AKA J Mac. Yeah, it's an honor. It's a blessing. I appreciate you yeah. much. Fantastic. So just so you guys know, we'll just have a conversation for 30, 45 minutes, depending on how long it goes. If you have questions, I'd love for you to drop them in the chat. If you want to come on, you can come on and ask them. Um, we like to do that, you know, straight live. And if not, you can just let us ask them for you. So Eric, I mean, you, you were a CMO, right? In corporate America, this whole notion of branding uh, has become, you know, part of your DNA, second nature to you. When I look at helping, you know, growing companies make their businesses better. Brand is a key piece of that. So let's just start with what is a brand in your mind? Yeah. I often go back to the story because people often consider a brand, you know, and I, I was in corporate America for over 20 years and I was doing that corporate grind and, you know, earning that paycheck every single week. And they say the two most addicting things in the world is number one, heroin, and number two, a <laughs> weekly paycheck. And I was, I was on that and I, I didn't know anything else. And at some point I realized there's got to be something bigger and better than this. I realized after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad from Robert Kiyosaki that I was making other people millionaires instead of myself millionaire. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was empowered to do something with my life and to figure out how to break from the system and the rat race. And that's truly what inspired me to kind of just figure out what my purpose was and I really didn't discover that until recently, you know, my, my yes, my why was my family. I gotta do my family. I gotta make money for the family. And, um, once I got beyond that and everything was okay at home and the, and, and, and the bills were being paid for, then that's when I got clarity and started to realize the purpose in life. Like you said, you know, how do we make the world better? One mic at a time. That's our mantra. That's what really set the path. And um, honestly, I forgot your answer, Jerry, because I went I went on a tailspin over here. But yeah, guide me back to where you where your question was. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's okay. What, so, what is a brand, right? Because oh, yeah, you brand. have all so, this rich this yes. rich rich history. Thank you. And so, what does so, that mean for people? So back in corporate America, branding was a logo, it was marketing, it was stuff on the billboards, and you can go back to the cowboy days when they actually literally branded like a cow mm. tied to like, Hey, Hey, Pardo, that's my cow. And you would make sure like your territory, your property was yours. And we branded things. So that's what I knew to design and create brands for corporations. And as I started to do that, and I moved away from the tactic side of it and started thinking about the strategy, I realized that brand was culture in corporate America. Like brand was the experience, the customer journey that is brand mm. every single touch point is part of the brand, right? Your experience with, let's take Apple, you go to the store or you order something online and how they speak to you, the cadence of the conversations through emails and phone and how they treat you when you walk in the door is, is brand. But then it started to evolve when I left corporate America and I started to realize there's personal brands, right? There, there's individuals. And at the time, personal brands, we only knew a few, Oprah Winfrey, Tony Robbins, 
you know, there were people that were household names, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and they had personal brands, meaning that there was a three dimensional sort of aspect to them. We knew their, we knew their work, we knew their home life, we knew their mm -hmm. personal story, and that's all we knew. But then the advent of social media, and oh, now we have the access to tools that we didn't typically have, and we can start creating our own brands. And that has evolved recently into personal branding. So that has changed. It's not about um, your person, you know, the brand is culture, because a lot of us wouldn't typically have a company. And right. hopefully eventually you will, and you create a customer journey and experience everything I said that corporate sees brands as. But personal brands to me are critical. And what, what it re there's a many, many, many definitions, JMAC, uh, but the main definition for me that I think will resonate with most of you is your online reputation. Think of it that way. Your online reputation or the digitization of your reputation and the breadcrumbs that lead to your offer, the breadcrumbs that lead to the value you provide other people in their life and their business. That is the necessity that we call personal branding. And I think it's so critical because you're right. I mean, I grew up um, just like you. I'm a couple years, um, your junior, which I like to point out. Um, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> But I, I think about how my world would be different if I grew up in a world where everything was published. And I think about my five-year-old and my 10-year-old. They live in a world where they have their iPads. They have constant connection to the world. And that's part of this notion that, you know, making sure that you have alignment, you know, being authentically you. I was giving the example of the owner of the, of the Dallas Cowboys, you know, has all these charitable organizations, a man of the community. Oh, and then suddenly gets busted for a prostitution ring uh, down in Florida. And that is a problem um, when that happens. Actually, I apologize. It was not the Dallas Cowboys. It was the, um, it was the New England Patriots, Robert Kraft. I, I misspoke there. But there's still like this massive disjoint that, that happens as you go through that process. And it's almost like you can't make a mistake hmm. when you have that brand to be on point. And so what are the missteps that you see people have when they start trying to build a personal brand? You know, another name that comes to mind real quickly is Tiger Woods. That guy had an amazing yes. brand, an impeccable, bulletproof seemingly brand. And uh, look what he did. He just, how quickly, how long it takes to build your reputation and how quickly it can go away by one right. mistake. So hopefully that doesn't happen to us. We're not public figures in that sense. But what I see people doing is they're creating a brand, whether it's through a podcast or writing a book or speaking on stages or, you know, doing things like this, is that they don't have clarity on their message. It's so simple. Like, what is your core message? What is the problem that you solve? How do you help right. people? So a lot of people go in and it's a mishmash, you know, and, and I, and I applaud that, like, put yourself out there, figure it out along the way. That's the wonderful thing about social media and the internet and all these things that's happening is that nothing is permanent. It goes away. Trust me. People are going to see stuff and you may think, oh, that was a hot mess. It's going to go away. Trust me. It's in and out of the people's ears and they forget about it, you know, within minutes, you know, I think the average attention span now is like, thanks to TikTok. Point three seconds, whatever it is, it's something ridiculous. And people will thankfully forget something, but then you can continue trying and testing and putting yourself out there. But before you do that, I would highly recommend that you come up with your core values. What is your personal belief system? You know, mm. For me, the top three things are transparency and honesty. My family always comes first. I should have said that first. And I'm very results driven. I want to make sure that, you know, I, I, I promise and my, you know, I, I, I accomplish what I promise and I set out to do and I follow through with everything that I say I'm going to do. So if you come up with your core and you come up with pillars of content, you can start to dive into these things as you turn the camera on or you get onto a podcast or interview like this, you can now dive into what it is that you know in your heart is true to you. And now people start to tune in and they're like, oh, I keep hearing, hearing J Mac talk about, you know, positive impact and talking about the same things over and over and over. You think you're saying it over and over and over, but you're not because there's 
always a new, it's a rotating door of people that are coming in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. But that's what I notice people doing. They misstep on, on the consistency in their message. Mm. So talk to me a little bit about the whole notion of, you know, you talked about your pillars. You know, I've talked about this inside businesses, the business acceleration model, the foundation, it's vision, values, and resources, right? That's where everything starts. And I think it's the same thing for people, right? So when you really look at it, the same is true. Like, what is your vision? What's the impact that you want to go make in the world? Like my, mine's here. Hard to escape this when you make a public decora declaration and then a Zoom background, right? <laughs> this is what I'm going to go do. And so talk about, you know, focusing in to, to, to go do that. And the values are like the operating system by which you do everything every day. And so, you know, you can't have alignment with your actions if you don't even know what they are, right? And so any tips in getting people to spaces where they've been thoughtful of who they are as a person so that they can show up in an aligned way? I would go through the exercise. So once you come up with these pillars, you know, stories, stories sell. Right, fact stories tell facts sell whichever way that is. There's mm -hmm. the same. But if you start to create your content pillars and you start so you identify, say, let's say at minimum you have three. What are the stories that back that up? What are the lessons learned that back those up? Why do you, why are those your core content pillars? And start to tell those stories on stage, start to tell those stories on a podcast, start sharing the messages and the lessons that you learn so that other people can learn, you know, via your mistakes. Another big thing, Jerry, and I think you and I talked about this, um, it's, it's, it's programming, right? It's programming for your operating system and upgrading of your operating system. So a lot of us, a lot of us, especially me, came from limiting beliefs. Like I came from a world of, of scarcity and not abundance. And right. failure was not an option. You know, like my father drilled that into my head. I think like he grew up in the age where like NASA and space and flight and going to the moon. Yes, failure was not an option because like you would die. You would literally just die if you, if you failed. Uh, but nowadays it's like, we get it. We get it. Now failure is success in progress. And I had to say that to myself over and over and over. Failure is success in progress. Failure is success in progress. I want to get a tattoo. I don't have tattoos, but if I did, that would be the one because that was reprogramming my operating system and my belief that I have to fail in order to achieve. I have to fail in order to understand what works and what doesn't. So go back and realize what's your limiting beliefs. What is getting in the way of you taking the next, the next step? And you can even talk about those things in real time. You know, Gary Vee always talks about documenting the journey. Document the journey of discovery for yourself. You know, and I always say, do that carefully though. You know, don't do that. We always say, talk about your scars, don't talk about the wounds. So if it's something that you're working through and you haven't fully processed it and it's still sort of like there's a scab there, you don't want to talk, touch yet, don't talk about those things. That's, it's called airing your dirty laundry. But if you can go out there and you talk about the scars and the lessons that you learned along the way, and like I said, I can talk about failure, success, and progress because I finally rewrote that operating part of my operating system. I think it's uh, really interesting. You know, my daughter goes to uh, a Montessori school and it's by design, right? We, we love the, the methodology, but I was walking her into school after a dentist appointment and there were on big letters on the back door, fail. I thought, ooh, that is not very Montessori-like. What is this all about? And so as I got closer to the door, it said, first attempt in learning. Yes. Because when you frame that differently, that it's not a failure, it is the opportunity to say, okay, that didn't work. What should I try next? What's my next hypothesis to doing this? And I think it's so important because you know, as business leaders, it's all a hypothesis. We're looking at the landscape of the business. We're looking at our resources. We're looking at our people. We're looking at the market. We're looking at our competitors and we're saying, I think if I do this, that this may happen and it may not. And it's like, okay, let's make sure we leave dry gunpowder in the back room that we didn't like throw everything at it so that we can survive those mistakes, those learning moments. And 
I, I think that's a, a key piece. Like as you think about your limiting beliefs, and I've seen this um, in people, even in myself, right? What are my limiting beliefs? I should have been doing this two years ago. I knew I should have been doing this. And yet um, I don't really like my voice, if I'm being honest. I thought, hmm, I really more have a face for radio. So I shouldn't be doing live shows. I should be doing more. I see Craig's, Craig's nodding his head. Mike is too. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Erica, on the other hand, she did not. She did not nod her head. So thank you, Erica. Um, I'm going to trust your instincts over the two guys. Um, but, you know, all of those things are limiting beliefs. What will people think of me? Even if, I, as I had started the journey of, you know, so, going online, doing some Facebook lives and, and having those conversations, what are you finding as like the piece of why people aren't building their own brand? Yeah, I know we talked about this uh, earlier and, and days before. Um, what, what I figured is figured out for myself, and I, and I think that for others as well, rejection is the big piece of it, right? Um, if we can identify that what holds us back at times from stepping into anything, you know, going into a meeting or a meetup that you know you should be participating in or stepping on a stage when someone gives you the opportunity or even just guesting on a podcast where it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Right. A lot of people hold back even from starting a podcast or doing something like this. Why? Because there's this deep rooted fear of rejection. Like, wow, what do people think of me? Oh my goodness. What, what are they, they're not gonna like me. They're not gonna like my voice. They're not like me my glasses, my hair, the way I speak, blah, blah, blah. And we get in our own heads and this is hamster in our heads. That's like playing all these worst case scenarios of, you know, this thing that goes way back in our DNA and, and lineage and history is that like, we're not going to be eaten by that saber toothed tiger. We're not going to get pushed out of the village and we're going to go die of starvation. Like that fear of rejection needs to go away in order for us to start realizing that opportunities are abundant. Opportunities are around every single corner. And if you say yes, especially if you're an early entrepreneur, you're starting a business or you're getting to the next level of your business, there's opportunities that come and you, you jump into those opportunities without the fear of rejection, right? Because where does that rejection come from other than all those things that I mentioned, you know, it basically the root of it is from insecurity. Like we're insecure, all of us, like we have little bits and pieces of some insecurity that came from my mother, came from my father, came from wherever it came from. Somebody, somebody downloaded that into my operating system at a very young age. And how do we, how do we get past that insecurity? We have to start building up our confidence muscles. Like how do you get confident in your physical abilities, right? Well, you start stretching, right? You don't want to hurt yourself and just go to the gym. You start incremental steps to getting better physically. And then all of a sudden consistency and showing up leads and leads to results. And all of a sudden you're running a marathon. Or you're you're you know or you're 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 bench pressing 50 or 100 pounds or you're doing whatever it is because you took baby steps to get there so that's what we have to do is build up our confidence little by little by little and some of the things is like doing this like people may be thinking they're watching me and they're like man he's talking not the name drop but i was talking to to uh gary v and he said to me on the show he said dude people hate people like us he goes 60 percent of people love us i like that he categorized us he put me in the same category and he said 40 percent of people hate us or they don't know what to think of us because it's too polished and he said it it, it causes someone to think oh do i trust this person they're, they're, mm -hmm. it's too good like you almost have to be imperfect in order for people to get faster to trust so it's okay is what i'm saying is put yourself out there and know that the more and more you do it the better and better you're going to get at it and it's going to become muscle memory it's just going to become like, hey, I'm just natural at doing this. I could speak on stages. I could speak on podcasts and I could think my thoughts and they just come out. And I don't care what people think. This is just me talking. You get to that bulletproof state because like I'm, I'm thinking of Mike Hines who participated in our um, fitness challenge in June. And he told me his goal was like to get from the couch to a 5K. And that was, you know, his goal. And he had great progress and success in, in, in doing that. I mean, is it simply... Like the notion of like, just start, you just have to like get off the couch and start in these things. 
it's it's setting up things in your environment that lead you to success all those little silly things and you guys heard this a million times i'm sure you know just when that alarm goes off you know that's a win getting up i, I still struggle with this i hit the snooze like everyone else but that's a win we don't realize that's the first win of the day like it's just springing up like wily e. coyote you know in the morning and the bed pops up and then like you fall into your jeans and then like you're, you're in your gym <laughs> clothes and then you just like sleepwalk to the gym like put tools around you that set yourself up for success so that you don't give yourself the excuse to procrastinate to say oh i'll just hit the snooze and i'll do that later uh, because what you're doing is you're setting up that expectation and you're breaking promises to yourself mm -hmm. from the second the day starts if you put in your mind and you program in your head that like when i wake up before the sun wakes and it's nighttime out man that's a freaking win <laughs> like i just beat the sun up everyone in my neighborhood and town is asleep and like how great does that feel then now what are you going to do with that time you have just hacked the system because you just got time back and you're going to take advantage of that time so those little things are habits and when we start creating those habits they stack and they stack and stack and stack and then over time you realize People are asking you, how do you keep winning? Because you created all these habits, micro habits. Right. That, uh, you know, creates what looks like success to others. I think it's interesting because I think the, you know, one of the key pieces, and I was just uh, ironically speaking to a client this morning, and he was talking about managing his own personal brand. And it, it's part of his now morning routine. And he was like, this is amazing. I'm three days into a morning routine where I'm working out. I'm meditating. I'm looking at my intentions. I'm looking at my calendar. I, he's like, I, it's almost like I have a superpower. And he's like, I know I'm only three days into it, but this is incredible. And the whole notion of like priming the pump and getting ourselves ready to perform is critical in all the things that we're doing. Because again, if we don't have that alignment, if we don't know ourselves well enough, then you can't show up in the way that you want to. And so it is those little habits that happen time and time again to do that. Any other pieces um, for you, how we start to go from that fear of rejection, which is caused by the insecurity, to get to a place of confidence to say, I don't really give a darn what people think about me. So how, how do you build that bulletproof mentality anything that's worked for you yeah i want to i want to ensure people know that right i i'm not i'm not perfect i mess things up all the time and i you know i have things that i'm working through right now that i'm like that's going to be a lesson not right now but i'm going to share what how i came out of that uh currently and the and the problems i don't know why j mac but it seems to get bigger and bigger the problems um but it's it's celebrating the micro wins truly honestly it's like mm -hmm working harder than everyone else and understanding that work wins over talent when talent doesn't work so you can be talented sure and those people we know we grew up in high school with those and they it was annoying they wouldn't study or do anything i was one of those people actually <laughs> didn't study and then you would get decent grades right i would phone it in i wouldn't study i'd get a b minus imagine if i freaking tried but imagine those people that are talented that don't work so imagine if you work, you'll beat those people. Imagine if you're talented and you work, you're going to crush. So whenever I'm in crushing mode, man, a lot of really cool things happen, right? So we just signed a client that's going to pay us about $52.50 um, a month, which that's not our biggest client, but it's a, it's a big win, right? So I yep. always celebrate those micro wins. And I, call my, I call my business partner, I'm like, this is amazing, look what happened, and then go back to work. But then what happens over time as you start to celebrate all these micro wins, getting up early in the morning and saying to your spouse, oh, I did it three days in a row, four days in a row, all these little things will create this swell and this cadence and this, this tsunami of confidence over time, where now you can start talking to business owners and people and multimillionaires with confidence because you've just accomplished all these things that are subconscious in your mind because you've been celebrating wins. And you're like, man, look at all these case studies. I may not be putting it out there yet, but they're all up here. And that gives me confidence because I can start, like I just shared with you, 5250. If I was in, if I was in corporate America, I would never have under, uh, comprehended that. 
I can make right. people and help people and, 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 and inspire people to sign big contracts, relatively big contracts. So celebrate the little wins, 100%. It's uh, so important because especially high achievers, we forget to celebrate along the way. We just keep on moving the goalpost back. It's like, okay, you know, Sean Acker talks about this in his TED talk. Like, okay, I've, I have good great grades. I need to get better grades. I have a good car. I want to get a better car. I got a nice house. I want to have a better house. And you just continue to move success over the cognitive horizon. And when you do that, it leaves you to this place of like, ah, more and more and more, you know, the words of the devil more and now. And so celebrating those small wins absolutely play into your confidence in being able to continue to propel yourself forward. But if you never stop to celebrate the wins, some people, despite obvious success, feel like they've never accomplished anything because they're continuing to chase the further goalpost that's down the way that um, they never get that satisfaction of when is it enough. And so I think that's a really, a really good piece. Eric, when you think about um, brands, what is it? What's the value of having a brand, a personal brand? So I'll go back to the corporate brands, and then I'll 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 I'll, I'll relate it to personal branding. Let's think of Apple. Let's think of Nike. Let's think of Starbucks. You know the biggest brands in the world. In that case, yes, a logo and an image is very powerful because what have they done? And I used to be a part of that and developing those brands for those uh, large Fortune one hundreds. Is that you can create something that's identifiable when you're driving 80 miles, you know, you shouldn't be driving that fast, whatever the speed limit is, 70 miles an hour on the highway, you can recognize something like that. My little girls, when we're driving, they'll go Starbucks, you know, they can't read and they know the little mermaid is Starbucks. So how do we do that for personal brands? How do we do that for, for our businesses? This is really tactical. So hopefully this is helpful. Sure. When you're developing a logo for your brand, for your personal brand, for your company, for your podcast. Always consider this, and this is this goes back to like the '90s when I was in college, and some of the biggest, you know, one of the amazing. I went to school in New York City at School of Visual Arts. I had like MTV's creative director as my teacher, and people that were just amazing. Pentagram, all these gigantic ad agencies you see in the movies, they were my teachers. One guy said. Joe Messina, I'll never forget. He said, when you create a design, oh, it's so amazing that I have this here. When you create a logo, and he was saying this before social media, always design something that's recognizable at the size of a dime. Mm -hmm. Because why? It's gonna be small. It's gonna be in a lot of different places. It's gonna be on a pencil. And it has to be simple. So what I've noticed is people create cover art for their podcast, they create all this stuff, they create, and there's too much detail. There's too many, there's all this stuff. And I'm like, it needs to be recognizable within a split second. Now, if you look at my logo on air brands, everything that I create is like, I got it. I got it. I got it. You don't even know, know to know what my company does, but you hear on air. Like, oh shit. Yeah. He's putting us on the air. I get it. So if you can distill what you do in words, and then an image like that, that's identifiable within a split second, people understand what you do, you're gold. Now, how do you get that done, right? You're like, ah, man, I went to school for business or I went to school for this or that. You hire people that have been doing it. It's easier for them because they know the chemical makeup and the DNA of what is a good brand. Um, now I'm not talking about just the tactics, but you have to understand, like I was saying, the, the pillars right? With your personal brain, with your company, that is also powerful. You don't necessarily need a powerful logo, but if your company, they, they move and they operate and they all speak the same language, that's going to be something that gives trust and instills trust in your clientele. Because they're like, man, I spoke to J Max assistant. I spoke to J Max producer. I spoke to J Max. All these people, it's like I'm talking to one person, a collective. That's powerful. And that takes culture. That's big. I love it. I think it's interesting because, you know, Zach Mitchell's joined us and Zach and I work together. So when I think about personal brands and what people would say about you when you're not in the room, right? Because I say the same thing about value, companies' values. It's what people 
it's the stories people tell at the lunchroom when you're not there, right? That's that's the those are the real values of the company. And so when I think about the value of personal brand, and I think about Zach, I think about a leader, a great communicator, a pragmatic problem solver, right? And those things follow you no matter where you're going, right? And so part of that, and I think the opportunity that we have with social media in particular, is you can become known for those things by a acting authentically knowing who you are and how you're going to show up you know i I highlighted him in my presentation uh last week or the week before you know when you get people talking that's when you know you're winning right i stole that from him get people talking and so you can use social media to amplify the things that you believe in so much so that you're valuable not only inside your company and create that alignment you know, if you're running the company or you're a leader, this is how our division does it. But it's also in in the notion of, geez, I want Zach to do that for my company here. So you shorten the no like, and trust arc because you're well known for certain things, right? And I think that's part of the, the allure as I think about personal brands. And, you know, your specialty is, is, helping people launch podcasts. So making the world better one mic at a time. I think there's, there is a point of view that we can all share and we can be better for it. And I think that's a unique piece of the opportunity that we have today. Can you talk a little bit, I heard you speak on another podcast and I, I just thought this analogy was so good because I think people feel like podcasting or um, you know building your own brand right now is so saturated, right? Oh, there's so many podcasts, it's so saturated. And I think the illusion that you made to the dot-com era where websites and the internet came into commercial use and how that parallels to where we are now with people building media companies, whether it's through social media and podcasting. And can you share that perspective? Because I just thought it was so brilliant, Eric. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jerry. I When we were building on-air brands, you know, four or five years ago, everyone wanted a podcast, right? And they didn't know how to do it. And that's when I likened it to, you know, the dot com because it was nice. People started to realize they, oh, I got to leverage a podcast for my business, right? Not just for notoriety's sake or not to be the next Joe Rogan, but I see this is a great asset and tool. I hate calling it a tool because, but if you're using it correctly and you're using it with authenticity and you're not putting it out there to hurt people, because there are people that leverage podcasts strictly for selling and there's, that's okay. But I would put that up front, just a word of advice. Tell the person that you're interviewing that, hey, uh, I have some stuff I think that can truly help you, um, but don't don't sucker punch them <laughs> with a sell. I, yeah. I don't like being on podcasts like that. So then what happens is you start to create a podcast very much like with the webs. The webs. Everybody needed a website because it, it was the modern day uh, trifold. It was the modern day business card. And podcasting got through that phase. I think we're kind of getting out of that phase because everyone started figuring it out. Like, okay, I have a podcast now. What do I do with it? But now I think that people are starting to realize, and I'm I'm reading the tea leaves here because I have a lot of conversations, hundreds and hundreds of people, is that now that you have a podcast, now what? Is it creating what you wanted it to create for you? Well, understand that if you're not getting the ROI, right? Look at the relationship on your money, not just the return. Uh, Because like people are thinking about it as I want money, it's radio. It's like, I get ads, I get 100, 1-800 mattress, I get get zip recruiter and stamp it on my, you know, poor baby podcast's head. That's not necessarily the best avenue. So if you think about it as a relationship builder, that's how I know Jerry, that's how I know everyone in our communities, we we did it through podcasting. So, but but what I was alluding to is it's now transitioning to how does this fuse with everything else I'm doing, because it's almost a necessary, if not unnecessary component of a personal brand. So for me, the necessary pieces that are all hard to build, because they're all separate entities and businesses potentially, is a podcast, number one, is part of a personal brand ecosystem, writing a book, So congratulations for those of you who have written a book. I'd say continue doing that because that is once you're in the home, you're in the heart. Lewis Howes said that when I went through his training. And then you speak on stages, right? You, how do you, what's the fastest way to make 100 strangers, 100 raving fans? Speak on a stage. 
I mean, Jerry and I often try to get on stage whenever we can. Jerry was at one of my event, my events recently, and it's powerful. It's so, so powerful. So if you can get those three things fused together, and even I would include this, building a community virtually is very powerful as well. You start to see the ecosystem that becomes your personal brand. So that I think, aside from the podcast, if you can accomplish all of that, but don't be overwhelmed little by little by little, <laughs> if you find the right people and you put them in your corner and they can support you in all those four, three to four things, man, you're going to be winning because you're going to stand out above 99.9% out above of people who aren't doing it. I think you're right. I mean, I just look in, in today's day and age, and I do this because of this. Right? I'm, I'm not doing this for business, right? I'm not going to call you next week and say, Eric, let's work together. That's not why I'm doing this. It's to you know, help people get into better places in, in, their, in their world, right? Because we all have our own brand inside our own companies. What are people thinking about Eric Cabral? That's the way it happens, right? And so we have to be conscious of it. You have it whether you know it or not. If you bring conscious attention to it, and you create that predictability, then people can, you know, I call it, you need to have a handle on your business. You have a handle, like I can count on Jerry to do this. And I want people to do that. But there, there is this magical thing that unfolds. You know, I've been asked to speak three times in the last 30 days. And it was because somehow people found me or saw me or said, hey, I think your point of view is pretty interesting. Can you speak to my company? And so that just becomes that virtuous cycle of aligned impact because that's who I want to be. That's what I want to go do. And getting past that point of fear of rejection, which I had for two years before, you know, actually taking the plunge of doing this was I'm so aligned to my why that I'm willing to be uncomfortable to take action. And, you know, I think that's really, you know, at the core of what you're talking about here, because you can't, first of all, you have a brand, no matter whether you like it or not, right? Because it's what people think about you. And so you might as well bring some conscious intention to it and figure that vision, the values, like my content pillars, what are the things that I'm going to be known for? And the outputs of that can be magical, right? The opportunity to fulfill the vision that that you really want, the impact that you really want. Yeah, absolutely, brother. Where do people go wrong building their brand, Eric? Any like train wrecks out there or places places where like, you know, hey, you know, I think it's really important, um, you know, the mindset of the guide, right? I, I might be only two steps in front of you, but if there's a pothole, I can turn around and say, hey, Eric, watch for the pothole that's just in front of you, right? And you can share that with people. Are there any things where you're like, man, this is a place where people just miss? I think, Jerry, that, and I think, you know, I suffer from this. A lot of us probably suffer from this, but focus, 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 focus. Like I've grown to understand, and one of my coaches, and I have many, many coaches, but one of them is as uh, that diluted focus equals diluted results. Diluted totally. focus equals diluted results. And I was, I am always, and I have to take it out of my bio. Like Eric is a serial entrepreneur. And then people introduce me as such. And I hate it. It's like nails on a chalkboard. And they're like, why, why is that? That's a cool thing. I'm like, no, it's not. Cause what it means is like, I'm doing too much. And none of them, none of these businesses, these four businesses that I'm operating are getting 100% of my attention. So when I started to focus strictly on one company and one product, one service, man, we 5X, actually we 10X the business in a year. That's insanity. That's insanity, right, Jer? So like, wow, that's proof positive that focus will create the results that you want. But I had to understand that as I am this entrepreneur who has this disease of ch chasing shiny objects, finding other outlets for my creativity instead of like, I'm going to start that business or I'm going to make this arm of the business or I'm going to do this one. Or, I'm going to do this one. Like understanding that, okay, this will be your brand. It's going to become a new business, but right now it's a book. I had to understand that. How does that relate to what I'm doing and the focus that I have right now with this company? And how does it complement? How is it going to serve? How is it going to help more people? Well, number one, it's going to build a community. Community that's already there, but they don't currently have this brand. 
that I'm creating this personal brand and how to and why to do it. So I think focus is key. J Mac, definitely. I think you're right. And I mean, I, I, I see Carrie McCann's on the call. I helped uh, her company run their strategic plan uh, a couple weeks back. And one of the things that we talked about specifically was fewer objectives. We were going to get throughput on fewer things because when you have a room full of visionaries, um, it is hard to say no to things because we're selling 2023's model in 2022. Unfortunately, we don't have any of them in stock. And so let's focus in on the here and now and get the throughput to the finish line and stay super ultra focused and disciplined. I think you're 100% on point there. And I'm, I'm seeing that, especially in, in today's day and age where you know, idea after idea after idea is possible. Yeah. Can I share what happened in that experience so that people have some context? I'd love it. To, to you know, shiny object syndrome and building a lot of things at the same time, and it's cool and it's sexy. And, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I got five businesses. Um, you, you, you know me and one of my brands to be Podmax. Yep. A year ago, I had to decide, am I going to continue with this company or am I going to fold it? So it's currently in the process as a business, not a brand, we can still use the brand and the event and the time, the, 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 the name, but as a business, it wasn't necessarily working. And this is when I, when I, when I mentioned that conversation with Gary, we were talking about this particular company and I made several mistakes along the way. We didn't know exactly what our superpower was. Like it was an, is it an event? Is it a live event? Is it a virtual event? When people come through, what are we truly giving people? What are we offering people? And we noticed that there was a community building and we were like, we have nothing to give them. They want more. So we started to build products, and products and products on top of it and on top of it. And we became diluted. We had no focus whatsoever. And the big mistake that we made that Gary did point out, and I'm hoping that people here can, can learn from this mistake without having to go through all the hurdles to get to Gary is that he said, you turned that business into a transaction first before a relationship. Now, yes, no, I agree with that. I mean, I, I know J Mac through PodMax indirectly. So there were benefits and I did have built, I did build relationships and that's actually how I met him through PodMax. We, we interviewed his entire C-suite uh, through that PodMax experience, but he's right. It turned into a transaction. We were charging $3,000 to get in the door. People were paying it. And that seemed like a really good business, but it was too soon, right? We, the, the ratio of, of ask and give was off. And I think mm. it ran through its course over the, over about a year and a half. And we started to see attendance dip and I got scared. Truly. I said, what do I do here? And that's when I called and I said, Hey Gary, what do we do here? And he's like, yeah, you, you kind of screwed the pooch. <laughs> so either you, you fix it, he mentioned a number of ways and I, I just didn't think we had it in, the, in us. And I didn't think we had the team to do what he was saying, which was to, to find bigger and better podcasts like the Joe Rogans of the world to participate in the event, which was really hard to do, not impossible, but it was difficult. And he said, get more of that. He's like, increase the value of the product you're offering. Um, and we focused, that's where we decided on air brands, podcast launches and production is our focus and then poosh, took off. So that was the right choice. He didn't tell me to do that, but yeah. I love that. I, I mean, it, it's, I, I think back on mistakes that I've made over the course of my career. And it's because I lost focus of this is the thing that I'm doing. And this is the thing that I'm world-class at. And, you know, when you, when you miss that mark, I think um, you're right. You have the opportunity to invite more failure or more confusion and, you know, I, I talked about this in the hiring episode, the whole, you know, uh, transformation that COVID has, has given us, which is relationships first, right? People are looking for transformations. They're not looking for transactions. They're not willing to trade time for money. They want elevation of the relationship. And I think that's why you're seeing so much happen right now around this to be, be in the relationship business first. Because, you know, again, I'll steal Zach's line. When people are talking, that's when you know you're winning because the relationships are blossoming and you're having hard conversations. And, you know, those things are super critical. It's great. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions 
but feel free to put them in the chat. I mean, I have gotten so much from you, Eric, in just thinking about even, even my brand and what I'm trying to do and the impact that I'm trying to make on the world, right? Because I think everyone has this opportunity in today's day and age. I know Mike Hines is working on you know, his brand and thinking about how he's showing up and who he is serving and how to do that. Because at the end of the day, all of us, whether you are a leader inside of a company or you are the entrepreneur, you know, you have to solve a problem that is important enough and painful enough that people are willing to take their wallet out and pay you for it. And that's the piece that I think when you're really getting down to it, you have to say in a competitive marketplace, whether it's consumers that are choosing you or whether it's a company that's inviting you on the mission, your advantage can be getting over that fear of rejection and into, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to be known for these things because then people have an opportunity to choose me or to invite me on the mission with them. And I think that's really the lesson that you have shared and the gift that you have given us uh, in the time here today. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, brother. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Well, so one of the things that I think about, Eric, on, on your side, when I think about your brand and what I know of you, because you like came into my life maybe 10 months before I actually even ever met you or spoke to you because people kept on connecting us that, you know, you have to speak with Eric Cabral. You have to speak with Eric Cabral. And that to me is holy smokes, right? And what was what were the stories people were telling when you weren't there? He's super smart. He's incredibly kind and very thoughtful. And that has been my experience in getting to know you. And so that's, that's my authentic plug there. Thanks for sharing, Jerry. I appreciate that. Yeah. Looks like my Mike. pleasure. Yeah, brother. Hey, Eric, just a question, because, you know, you talk about the pod max and, you know, you took it, you screwed the pooch and Gary V. Kind of right? <laughs> there was a lot of F-bombs. I told myself I wouldn't yell on the pod. I wouldn't swear on the podcast or any podcast because my girls may listen someday. And I'm not even kidding with you, Mike. I was I was so excited that I was on the show and I came out into the kitchen. And I, sh- I was playing it on speaker of my wife and you hear as soon as they start talking like f and this and f and that because you get around gary and his cadence yep that's an excuse but yeah my wife's like what are you doing shut it off (laughs) so i guess my question there is there's obviously a lot of pain in there you know f bombs both in the excitement of gary i mean uh gary and then and then also you know in the pain right but like what what got you to the point? He said, you said he threw several ideas at you, but then you kind of went away. I mean, yeah. you worked on magic. Like what went into your deciding to go this? What was the, I'm kind of asking for, you know, what was the secret sauce that made this the right decision? <laughs> to be honest, Mike, it was, <laughs> it was easier. Um, I had been running on air brands for several years. Um, it was keeping the lights on and I was ignoring it. You know, it was paying for PodMax. And when he told me, hey, do this, this, and this, and one of them was get the Rogans, get the Tim Ferrises, get the big, big names, which we did. You know, we got him and his team and all these people and David Meltzer and uh, Jordan Harbinger was massive in the podcasting world. We got a lot of big names in the room, but that was work. It was hard. Like I, that's how I started building relationships that Jerry's talking about. It's building a reputation so that people would say, yes, like I didn't pay. I think I paid for one or two speakers and that was it out of like dozens. So when he, when he said, do that at speed and at scale, that scared me. I was like, how am I going to do that? It's going to take a long time. Like we need, we need cash in this business or I, I can't continue operating it. And then I looked over here and I said, wait a minute, this company is feeding this company. This company is making money that pays for this team. What if I just told the team to work on this company? And that's what we did. You know, we looked at the numbers and we said, we did our projections and we saw that wow, if we do this, we're going to make a million dollars in a year. Like we're going to make a multi-million dollar company. And it happened. And we're like, wow, this is so cool. So that's what it was. I, I, I do truly feel like if I had the capital, the time, the energy, and the passion to continue doing what we were doing, that could have and would have exploded if I followed his advice. But at the time, it was just a necessity to focus on launching podcasts and doing podcast production. Hope that answers cool. your question, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes the simplest solution is obviously the best one, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I think as high achievers, Mike, we think we get extra stars for um, doing the really hard things. Yeah. But the reality of it is, do the easy things. Just do them extraordinarily well. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, <laughs> if you're if if you need to feed like an army, and like the quickest thing is to just like slap some peanut butter and jelly together, versus like I'm gonna make a gourmet meal. Like I just need to feed people. I just need to make sure that everyone is getting what they need. And then once they're sustained and once, you know, everyone's fed, then I could start, okay, hey guys, you want to take this another level? You know, maybe throw some bananas in there. We'll start, we'll start creating something else that's a little bit bigger and better and tasteful. <laughs> but yeah, that's really what it was. It was just going to the thing that was proven over, over time. Really How do people find you if they want to get more Eric Cabral? Oh, I want to, I want to give to anyone and everyone here who's into podcasting yep. or is thinking about it, or you already have one, I have accumulated over time, the podcast do's and don'ts. So like all the recommendations and all the recommendations not to do. So that you can find at my website, Eric, E-R-I-K, cabral.co slash guide. I'll put it here in the, in the chat. And you can just download that. There's actually a link too, if you're so inspired and you wanna chat with me, I truly feel, and I've told this to Jerry before, that we're getting to this phase of like time. You know, I just turned 50 for anyone who's curious. I just turned celebrating my 50th birthday. And I've realized that time is now my most valuable asset. So gifting that and putting that in the, the chat as well, like you can you can download the PDF. That's 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 where I want you to you know to go and do. But there is a link to actually chat for a little bit if you if you want to chat a little bit more. I love it. You are so generous, Eric. I really appreciate it. Yeah, brother. All right, friends. Thank you for coming and visiting today. Just a couple reminders, right? If you haven't joined us over on Facebook, we have the best places to lead a private Facebook group. I would invite you to go join over there. It's just a good place where good, nice people are hanging out who want to go make the world a better place. And I think it's amazing. And so, Eric, thank you for coming this week. I think you're amazing and everyone will see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel, Thursday, 3.30 Eastern time. And uh, I hope you guys have a great, wonderful weekend. Thanks, guys.